the shared spreadsheet that we have here uh, at the number 10, uh, there was a question from a reader uh, long before this gathering uh, about the, in Chapter 5, accessing. Your real possession is not as important as it once was, and accessing is more important than ever. Uh, but it, it seems that um, it, it's not very clear that uh, accessing is taking over, uh, especially around uh, services that require, say, more long-term relationships or uh, goods that require much more personalization and maintenance. So, yeah, what, what would you think? I think that the trend towards accessing versus owning things is still very strong is still continuing. I, I want to be sure that people understand that I'm not saying that everything will be accessed and nothing will be owned. Um, I think the way that it works out is that individuals, one by one, will have certain things that they feel very strongly about and care about, which they may own, and then the rest of it they'll just access. Um, and that what people care about will be different for each person so that on a average access is increasing, but individuals may certainly still own certain kinds of things because they have a, an attachment to the physical thing or they care about it in some other way. Right, our interpreter made a rather interesting interpretation, uh, meaning that uh, saying that uh, things that we have psychological attachment with uh, will still remain owned as part of us. But uh, according it's not to so you, much it's not so much psychological attachment, uh, although it, it, it could be. It's it's, um, for instance, um, I may care about um, the quality of a camera or maybe I'm a professional photographer. And in that case, um, because I know a lot about it, because um, I may have some appreciation of the aesthetics of it, or uh, I may have a, a, a market reason, maybe it's tools and I just need access to it all the time. I, I, may, I may find that photography is something where I'm always buying things uh, even though they're almost disposable or, or, or whatever. Um, and so there's, I think there could be, we could find up a number of different reasons why someone would have a particular, uh, would give attention to owning things in a particular realm. And, 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 and it may be because it's close to your business. It may be because that you have um, an appreciation. It may be because that's the only way you can get what you want. So, but the, the important thing is, is that these will be very, very specific and narrow areas where you care for a number of different reasons. You care about something and you, you care to own it because in some, because you know, on, in a global view, somebody has to own it. If you're accessing it, somebody has to own it. So there has to be um, some ownership somewhere. And sometimes that ownership will come because someone's trying to make a business. Sometimes it comes because they have a passion for it. Sometimes it may be because they have um, a psychological investment in it. There could be many reasons, but it's not, you can't have a system that nobody owns anything. So ownership has to continue. It's just that the distribution of ownership will shift. So, um, yeah, so there's a, a whole bunch of questions around blockchain um, that um, are more or less the same. <laughs> and, um, but it's essentially saying, you know, now that we've federated trust, uh, in a sense, uh, in, in um, algorithmized laws and contracts, in a sense, um, w w what's your take on this? Um, blockchain, which is, of course, the underpinning technology to the cryptocurrencies, reminds me a lot of um, computers before the Internet. Standalone computers were kind of were, were powerful, but they didn't really change the world until we connected it to the phone. 
and they made that. And, and that's when their the true power came in. And I think, I, I feel like Bitcoin is a little bit like computers before they meet the phone company. They haven't, it hasn't yet met the other half that it needs to become this great power in the world. So there's still something missing. And I don't think it's cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrencies are kind of interesting, but um, I don't think they're necessarily revolutionary in themselves. Uh, certainly, I think the states are going to, I mean, I think the states could mandate, require cryptocurrencies because it makes money laundering visible. Um, and so I think a lot of the attractions of it aren't necessarily the way that they're going to come out. So, um, and as payment systems, of course, there's, they have many qualities. But I think the question of what is the full impact of blockchain is that it's a very powerful technology that's still waiting for its other half, something else that needs to be invented that before it's really going to come into its own. Okay, that's great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so question 17, and, and it requires a little bit of context. Uh, in the first chapter, Becoming, uh, you mentioned something very um, astute about the internet is that it, it runs on code, it uh, runs on the current version of code, it has no notion of history. So whether you know internet when it was first founded by you know the IETF folks, or the World Web, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the current version of the internet that you can use to create things uh, and things like that. And but uh, so a, a common question from this is then, but collectively as a culture, as with you know the law or arts or whatever, we collectively have a cultural history. So um, do, do you think that the technology is making us the culture also relatively history free, or can we feed back this collective human humanity? I would say experience and t history into technology. Um. What you've just described is the agenda of the Long Now Foundation, which I'm a charter founder, a co-founder, board member of, which is trying to do exactly that, is to say, um, obviously, the Internet has a history. It's just not uh, in, the, in our own, in the minds of the humans. It's it's there. It can be, it can be found. But, uh, and, and, and also it has a history in the sense that certain things that are happening today happened because of choices in the past, whether they decided a protocol or whatever, uh, this is how it's being done. And therefore that's how we, that's the technology we have today because it has a history. The, the challenge that you were identifying was how can we make that more obvious to people, more central, more important to humans so that we can make better decisions. And, um, I think, uh, again, what at, speaking with Long Now, we have some ideas, a few ideas about how to, to do that. Um, and one of them is to try and um, uh, make the context for whatever we're talking about to broaden it to widen it, to include um, more of the factors that are that, that actually that play a part. So it's it's a, a general broadening of the conversation around anything will help bring a longer term context in it because the more context you see, they all have a time factor and so that will broaden it. So I would say the most elementary step is to widen the context of the question that would generally be the easiest way to begin putting it in a wider context of time. There was a, another question on the list which was asking about books that I'm reading and I just finished two books that were basically histories. One was about the Wright brothers, a book about the two brothers who invented the first successful airplane and their investigations into aeronautics. And 
um, once you understand that history of went into aeronautics, it's very, very valuable to understanding where the history of flight in the future will go because you have that sense of where it came from. And the second book that I just finished reading was uh, a book that has not been published. I was reading the galleys called The Friendly Orange Glow, which was about this unknown history of the personal computer, how it had been all the so many major innovations were discovered not by Apple, not by Xerox Park, but by this group of students in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, who came up with the flat screen TV, the touch screen, instant messaging, multiplayer games, all long before anybody else in, in the 1960s and 70s. And yet we don't know about them. They disappeared. This is an alternative, true history of the internet and personal computers. And it was like, well, why didn't, why don't we know about them? What happened? And that kind of, of thinking about, well, where did the touch screen come from? Um, that history is extremely powerful for thinking about what comes next after the touch screen. Um, so question 22, um, since the internet is ahistorical, it's, it's a being that we can exit any time. And this is mentioned in the book that people need to keep learning, uh, the curiosity being the intrinsic motivation. Does it actually uh, imply that we can take a leave, a break, a sabbatical uh, from internet, from new technologies, but, but come back, you know, without, you know, worry about uh, the fear of missing out because there's nothing to miss out. You can always start in here. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think taking sabbaticals, vacations from whatever you're doing, it's not just technology, but even your job or the current project, um, or taking a break from your own country and culture, um, all these things can lead to great insight because you are removing yourself from the current cycles and the concerns and you have a, you get to have an outside perspective and this new economy that we're creating with the internet and beyond is an economy that runs on thinking different differences. And the more we are connected the more 7 billion people are connected all the time, the more difficult it is to have a different idea. And taking a vacation, stepping out, using a machine that thinks differently, travel, um, following something that nobody, is, nobody cares about, all these are ways to help you think differently. And that is the, the primary wealth in this new world. And so um, I think there's, you know, taking a, a sabbatical from the internet is, is incredibly powerful. I think um, taking a sabbatical from whatever you're currently thinking on is also incredibly valuable. So um, it's not just about dropping out of the internet. It's, it's just about the, the, the habit of, removing yourself in order to have new perspectives and looking back and seeing what you what everybody assumes to be true may not be true you can only get that by going outside